but we need bigger GPUs. Last week was an incredibly huge one in tech. And as a chip designer, I'm beyond excited. So today we will have a look at the three hottest headlines of the last week. The new NVIDIA Blackwell GPU. Why is NVIDIA going for larger chips and making some serious trade-offs? Then we will discuss the new 4 trillion transistor chip from Cerebras and the new kind of analog chip we were all waiting for. NVIDIA is now at the top of the world. We've never seen such a profitability from a hardware company, right? That's one of the reasons why my investment portfolio looks so great. And now they revealed their new Blackwell GPU. Two hundred and eight billion transistors, and so so you could see you it, it, I can see there, there's a small line between two dies. This is the first time two dies have abutted like this together in such a way that the two chi the two dies think it's one chip. This new GPU providing four times the trading performance and up to thirty times the inference performance compared to the previous generation, the Hoppe GPU. First of all, let's discuss how did they manage to achieve this four-fold performance. As a first step, to double the performance, Nvidia has to double the area. Huh? Right? But that was an expensive decision, because the price per chip is actually the price per area, which depends, of course, on the technology node and the volume. In fact, NVIDIA had to keep using the N4P process by TSMC. N4P process is a refined version of the N4, with a 6%, yes, just 6% transistor density boost and 22% more energy efficiency over the N4. Unfortunately, NVIDIA had to stay at this process node because TSMC is currently struggling with this 3 nanometer process. To be specific, they are struggling to achieve the satisfactory yields. And this, of course, impacts not only NVIDIA, but also the roadmaps of AMD, Intel and other chipmakers. In a bid to maintain its competitive advantage, NVIDIA had to introduce double die design, which is packaged using TSMC's chip on wavefront substrate L packaging technology. This packaging technology is used to integrate multiple dyes side by side to achieve better interconnect density. And with that, you can achieve high speed and high bandwidth communication between the chips compared to conventional packaging methods. That's how they achieved nearly one single silicon. Now, if we consider the dual die design and the packaging, the cost of fabrication of this GPU more than doubles, more than doubles in comparison to the previous Hoppe GPU. So they will be definitely not getting to their legendary 85% margins as they used to. And they had to go for this trade-off, for this painful trade-off to maintain their competitive advantage because as we will see, the competition is heating up. All the hyperscalers are now developing their own custom silicon, like Amazon, Google, Meta. Everyone is designing their own AI chips. And also, as you know, AMD and Intel also want to get a piece of this pie. Startups like Cerebris and Grok also have some solid alternatives. So yes, Nvidia is definitely a leader in AI hardware and making great efforts to stay so, but the competition will not let them to rest for a moment. We've seen that doubling the silicon doubles the performance. But where the second double fold is coming from? It definitely doesn't come from the new process node, but rather from the new numbering format. It's coming from lowering the precision of the whole calculations. You know, we can encode the same number in, let's say, 8-bit, 20-bit, or in 4-bit, just what will change is the precision. But for the most calculations within the neural network, it's not really essential to compute, let's say, 20 digits of each number. The network can accomplish the same task at the same accuracy at a lower level of precision. And that's precisely the trick here. If we lower the precision of the calculation, let's say instead of 8-bit numbers, we'll be using 4-bit numbers. We can immediately save the half of the memory. 
because smaller numbers requires less energy to compute, requires less memory bandwidth, and the logic which is required to do this math takes up less silicon. In the previous Hopper GPU, they've used floating point numbers up to 8 bit precision. But with Blackwell GPU, they've taken it one step further. In the new Blackwell architecture, the matrix multiplication units doing math with numbers just 4 bits wide. This is another area from where the improvement in performance comes from. Honestly, 4 bits is quite low, and that makes me curious to see how well it's going to work for inference application, for example. Let me know what you think in the comments. To summarize it, the improvement in performance coming from connecting two GPUs together, supporting very low precision FP4 format, a massive amount of high bandwidth memory, and improved interconnect bandwidth. As simple as that. This GPU and the supercomputer DJX SuperPod build out of it will be available for sale later on this year. In one of the interviews, Jensen Huang said that they're gonna price it somewhere in between thirty to forty thousand dollars, and I have many doubts about this. First of all, since the H100 was selling for about forty thousand last year, so Blackwell is likely to be priced higher than that. For now, I'm really looking forward to see the real-world benchmarks. We are discussing different AI chips today, but just to give you a feeling of how high is demand for AI infrastructure is, there is a recent quote from TSMC founder Morris Chang. Regarding the demand for AI chips, he says, we are not talking about tens or hundreds of thousands of wafers, but instead building three, five or ten fabs. But we need bigger GPUs. Now, let's discuss the new, stunning 4 trillion transistor chip from Cerebras. This one is pretty unique, and they are crushing the Moore's law. You know that since the advent of microchips in 1972, the semiconductor industry has followed Moore's law. It states that the number of transistors on a chip is able to double roughly every two years. As you can see from this plot, Cerebrus seems to be outperforming this law, which many had believed was no longer applicable. Their previous chip was fabricated at 7 nanometers by TSMC, and the new one, the Wafer Scale Engine 3, is at 5 nanometers. The number of transistors on the chip is more than doubled since the previous generation, thanks to the technology node upgrade. But as we know, a huge success of this chip is a success by TSMC, which is able to fabricate such a giant, gigantic chip at 5 nanometers with a high yield. One of the reasons why Cerebras was successful over the last years is that they were doing things differently than others. While a silicon wafer can typically accommodate many chips, and that's what typically AMD, NVIDIA, and Intel are doing. They are cutting such a 300 mm wafer or 12 inch wafer into, let's say, 65 GPUs. While Cerebrus takes this wafer and makes a single giant chip out of it. To give you a feeling of the scale of this, this is the new Cerebrus chip next to the NVIDIA H100 GPU. It's 56 times larger than NVIDIA H100. Amidst the ongoing AI boom, there are many promising tech startups you may like to invest in, such as Cerebrus. But the problem is that investing in private equity generally is not easy. However, Link2 removes these barriers, making the access to private markets simple and open to everyone. Through Link2 platform, you can invest in some of the most promising AI tech startups I've discussed on my channel, such as Light Matter, the photonic AI startup I discussed in the previous episode. In addition, you can invest in Astera Labs, Samba Nova, Spark Cognition, and others. You can check out the full list of startups on their website. 
If you are interested in investing in the future of artificial intelligence, consider starting your private equity portfolio today using the link below. By using the code ANASTASIA500, you will receive a discount $500 off on your first investment. The code is valid for 30 days only. Thank you, Link2, for sponsoring this video. The rate at which we're advancing computing is insane, and it's still not fast enough, so we built another chip. Hopper is fantastic, but we need bigger GPUs. Going for larger silicon is such a great idea, and it totally makes sense for today's AI workloads. And C Cerebras was doing it before it became mainstream. <laughs> it's beneficial because many GPUs have to be used for a single AI task, and interconnecting them and distributing the load is a complex and expensive task to do. But by having one giant chip, you can significantly reduce the costs and complexity needed. This new Cerebrus chip features nearly 1 million AI cores, 900,000 AI cores, and 44 gigabytes of memory. And when it comes to memory, in this case, it is on-chip memory that is intertwined between the computing cores. And this has exactly the same goal uh, that we discussed in many of my previous videos, to keep the memory and the computing core as close as possible together, to reduce the bottleneck. And that's another architectural difference compared to NVIDIA and AMD GPUs, which have off-chip memory. This new AI chip is designed to train the next generation of giant large language models with up to 24 trillion parameters in size. Just think about it. It's 10 times larger than OpenAI GPT-4 and Google's Gemini. The next step is to connect 2048 of such chips together to build an AI supercomputer. And this one will be capable of reaching one quarter of Zetaflow performance, as one of my colleagues like to say. Oh dear. Such a machine, for example, could train a 70 billion parameters llama model from scratch in one day. It's pretty clear that the trend is headed towards larger silicon. But the thing is with the larger silicon that whenever I talk about Cerebras, for example, you always ask me about the yield, about the defects, and you're totally right. The bigger the silicon gets, the greater is the yield challenge, especially for the small process nodes uh, like sub 10 nanometers, because then the transistor's features become so uh, fragile and so tiny that a single particle, a single dust landing on a chip or a single defect in a chip can kill not just a transistor, but a large part of the circuit. Can you imagine that? And obviously you cannot get 200% yield. And this would mean that Cerebras would have to scrap every single wafer. This would have been such a disaster. Anyway, Cerebras manages to sell every single chip that they make. And whenever defects occur, they have a workaround. A defective AI core can be bypassed in the software and then replaced with one of the redundant or so-called spare cores. This way, you always get a configuration of 900,000 AI cores with no wafers wasted. And of course, NVIDIA is facing the same challenge, which is a headache for TSMC. And that's the reason why they didn't get to uh, a 3 nanometer process, because the yield is at I don't know, 80%, so it's quite poor. Eventually, they were able to find a trade-off. Let me know what you think in the comments. And if you're enjoying this video, consider subscribing to the channel and sharing this video with your friends and on social media. This helps the channel a lot. Thank you. It's clear that AI is in desperate need for a hardware revolution. And everyone is looking for a type of architecture that can mimic our human's brain. Because our human's brain is still the most efficient engine for non-artificial intelligence. We've known for decades that analog can be much more energy efficient and area efficient than conventional digital chips. If so, then why analog chips haven't become mainstream yet? Well, because there are a plethora of problems. 
We've discussed them in my previous videos. We will also talk about it today. But the new and charge chip addressing the most of them and also taking analog computing to the whole new level. First of all, many computing tasks and especially generative AI requires tons of memory. Tons of memory to deal with data and parameters of neural networks. These computing tasks are dominated by just a few basic operations that draw on memory. The cost of accessing the memory can be orders of magnitude higher than the energy expended on the computing operation itself. Now, what if we could make these memory intense tasks more efficient and by that make the overall thing orders of magnitude more efficient? One of the emerging approaches addressing this memory bottleneck is near memory or in memory computing. And that's usually implemented in analog fashion. Analog means that instead of operating with digital signals like zeros and ones and conventional transistors, Analog uh, chips are working with continuous signals, and a continuous signal can be anything between 0 and 1. And then we use analog circuits, which are consisting of, for example, resistors and capacitors. And the new N-charge chip is taking this concept to the new level. Actually, the main, the key operation that is at the heart of AI programs is so-called matrix multiply accumulate operation. You may remember talking about it in many of my previous videos, so you probably already know it. What happens is that a chip loads input values into the memory and then multiplies these values by so-called weights. Many such multiplications are performed in parallel and then the result as the output is added, so added up. This is known as accumulate operation. And there were already many and many attempts in the past to implement this operation in analog way. For example, the mythic chip, which I previously discussed. It performs multiply accumulate operations in an analog circuit using resistors and then sums up the currents at the output. However, along with this, various problems associated with noise, mismatch, accuracy cropped up. Mythic has really struggled, really struggled to find solutions to these issues over the last years, and eventually they pivoted to a different application. Well, N-Charge approach is different. Their computing is carried out using charge domain computation with metal capacitors, and I think it's a great idea. Let me explain. Instead of performing the entire matrix multiply accumulate operation in analog, they are performing multiply operation in digital with transistors. And then the accumulate operation is implemented in a very interesting way in analog using capacitors. And the trick here is that instead of adding up currents at the output, they are adding up the charge in a capacitor. So they're basically accumulating the charge in a capacitor, which is a great thing to do because it's quite easy and precise. And moreover, they're using the capacitors, which are coming anyway for free. You know, billions of transistors on a chip, they are interconnected with the metal wires, which can be seen uh, like a multi-level highway with up to 10 or 20 layers deep. And in this chip, they are utilizing the capacitors which are made of the parts of this metal interconnects that sit on top of the transistors. And the best part about this, that these metal capacitors are really easy to deal with. They don't have any uh, temperature dependencies or components mismatch, and the size is very well controlled with the CMOS technology. So it's a good element in general, you know? And the best part about this is that they're performing analog computing using digital technology, which is very advanced, which, which is easy to deal with with all the EDA tools that we have now. And they've already made a first prototype of this chip, which is reportedly showing a striking improvement in energy efficiency. It's capable of 150 trillion operations per second per watt, which is at least 20 times more energy efficient than previous analog chips. 
like Mythic, for example. On top of that, they've also built a software stack for it that manages this whole access to the memory. And their first commercial product is already coming later on this year. Looking forward to it. As a first step, they are targeting inference applications, which means taking an already pre-trained model and running it locally on the chip. And here, the main goal is to make it more energy efficient. And that's exactly what analog computing is good for. And at such a low power, you can put it to the age devices, for example, to your phone. But afterwards, according to the NCharge, this approach can also be scaled to the AI training. I really love this approach. When I read it, I was like, that's good, because the trick is that in CMOS technology, a capacitor is the most reliable thing you can really get. And in general, this approach takes the best of both worlds, analog and digital. And as it's based on digital, it can also scale quite well. You know, it's been a dark time, or you call it also winter, for analog technology, I think, but now it's getting warmer and the spring is coming. And as always, I'm looking forward to reading what you think about this technology in the comments. I love this decade, the decade of technological acceleration, and I love making the videos about it, you know, for you guys and to build the community around this channel. Thank you for being a part of it. And if you want to support the channel, me creating these videos, you can check out the Patreon. The link is in the description below. And also check out the sponsor. And if you want, let's connect on LinkedIn. Honestly, I never used it, but I changed my mind. <laughs> so if you want, you can scan this code and uh, let's connect. Thank you so much. And I will see you in the next episode. Ciao.